Hi there. Nice to talk to you again. Uh, we are, well, let me, let me welcome you. Welcome to the uh, next in the series, the next module in the series on this, <coughs> excuse me, on this special certificate in environmental loss and investigation. Uh, for this module, the focus will be on blue laws. Okay. Now, before I talk about what is covered under blue laws, let me just uh, sort of uh, summarize uh, kung ano yung approach natin. Okay. It will not be that different from what we did under green laws. Uh, you might recall, you know, how each for each law I broke it out in three separate sections of discussion just to kind of give a, uh, a narrative, medyo a flow as to you know, how we're gonna you know, discuss and understand these laws. So, ganun pa rin. I, I haven't really changed um, the approach. Uh, hopefully, it's working for you. Uh, but nonetheless, it's gonna be the same. Although, ang mag lang siguro is that I will not be uh, stopping to uh, alert you of what I'm going to do. Um, basta gagawin ko na lang. It'll just, you know, a flow. Um, and I, I'm saying this because I'm sure you know, having having done uh, the six laws and the green laws, na nakita niya na what the flow is, uh, there won't be a necessity for me to you know kind of alert you that we're going to be shifting from the rationale to what's being covered and eventually the sanctions. Um, I think you know the flow already, so uh, just for the benefit of time, I, I will no longer be stopping, uh, no more hand holding, so to speak. Um, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and do it. Okay, <clears throat> so having said that, medyo magiging efficient tayo ng konti sa oras, uh, and that also mean that uh, medyo magiging short ang uh, blue laws. And besides the fact that that's the approach I'm going to be taking, uh, blue laws under blue laws there's really only two laws that are covered, and because of that, um, you know we're gonna get done sooner than we did with the green laws. Remember, in green laws, we had six laws. So anyway, ang pwedeng mangyari, uh, I don't know if this is exactly what they're gonna do. I, I guess we'll have to check with the administration, pero I made a suggestion, and I don't know if they'll um, consider it, but uh, the suggestion is to have the blue laws and the next module, which is the brown laws, uh, be scheduled on the same day. So there's a chance that may happen. And um, it would only really make sense considering that sabi nga natin, blue laws only has two laws. Whereas brown laws, that law, if I'm not mistaken, I think there's three laws under that. So between blue laws and brown laws, that's five laws. Whereas green laws, by itself, yung isang module na yun, had six laws. So medyo maraming uh, na-cover sa green laws uh, that we had to try and uh, be efficient about. Um, and for blue laws, there's really only two laws. Uh, plus, we're going to be major moving faster since there's no more uh, giving uh, heads up on what, um, what's going to happen next. <coughs> so uh, again, since major short lang blue laws and short in brown laws, uh, there's a high likelihood na yung nga may escape to sila on the same day. All right, so. Moving on, uh, blue, on blue laws, as I said, there's uh, two laws that are uh, covered. And uh, so with these two laws, kahit na medyo maikse, I think it's still worthwhile to split up the two laws into their own lessons. So what that means, of course, is magkakadalawang lessons tayo. Okay? The first lesson will focus on the first law. And that first law is uh, essentially the primary law in the Philippines on fisheries and um, uh, aquatic resources, okay? It's the Philippine Fisher Fisheries Code of 1998 as amended, okay? Uh, after that, we're gonna move on to lesson two, and lesson two will cover the next law, which discusses the Laguna Lake Development Authority, okay? Uh, that's the law, well, we're, we're gonna talk about the law that created that authority, that body, okay? which is a quasi-government agency uh, uh, focused on promoting uh, sustainable development in a particular body of water, which of course we know based on the title. 
that we're talking about Laguna, Laguna Bay. Okay? So I think that's all I'm going to say about the laws. I think the best thing to do at this point is to just dive right in. So having said that, why don't we go ahead and proceed and uh, let's start with lesson number one. So here we go. Lesson number one. And uh, what we're going to be talking about is the Philippine Fisheries Code of 1998, which is also referred to as RA or Republic Act number 8550 as amended. Uh, before we dive right into the uh, nitty-gritty, to the meat of uh, this law, um, uh, since I mentioned that it is uh, amended, uh, it didn't, the amendment did not repeal it. Uh, the law itself continues to be in force. Um, the, what the amendment did was essentially uh, focus on particular provisions, and those were that's where the amendments were applied. Okay, but. Uh, I think it's worthwhile discussing just briefly um, how this amendment came to be. This is the amendment. It's uh, Republic Act 10654, and it's got its own different title uh, called, well, the title is An Act to Prevent, Deter, and Eliminate Illegal, Unreported, and Unregulated Fishing. So, medyo nakatutok siya sa penal provisions, or at least to the acts that are criminalized, right? Um, and in a way, this was uh, uh, an essential uh, teeth that needed to be put on the law. Because when this law was first put into effect in 1998, itong, uh, RA 8550, there were um, some provisions that were lacking. Um, when I say lacking, they're, they're not uh, completely compliant with the, uh, some of the international standards. Um, in particular, the uh, European U Union had some standards that they, you know, um, were suggesting that um, uh, most, if not all, countries um, should be complying to. So uh, those standards uh, really meant a lot because uh, non-compliance uh, would mean uh, losing a particular actually a significant amount of aid from the uh, European U Union. I think uh, in this case, parang $9.5 million ata yung nakataya. So, ang Philippines was already given a um, kind of a warning na sinasabi na comply or else uh, you're gonna lose that grant. Parang ganyan na nangyari. So, during, this was during the time of uh, President Aquino and uh, so they, they were able to, during that time, they were able to uh, get their act together and they were able to draft uh, this amendment uh, which brings uh, this law up, up to par with uh, standards, the European Union standards, uh, so that it's in such a way that you know, it was able to keep the grant. Uh, the Philippines was able to keep the grant. Okay? They didn't get to a point na na red flag na na hindi na pwede, okay? But anyway, that was the amendment and that was the kind of the motivation behind the need to amend. Uh, and that happened, uh, rather, I think it was about 2015 is when they, when they put that law, that amendment into effect, okay? And like I said, it's, uh, it didn't repeal the entire uh, law. It didn't repeal the entire RA5550. Rather, it uh, only amended particular provisions. So, the rest of the uh, law, RA8550, remain in force to this day. Okay? Or at least the entire law. But, uh, uh, yung, the, the, again, the only thing that changed really are the provisions that were amended by RA10654. So, what we're going to find in terms of what this law is all about, okay, is uh, exactly what is expressed in the long title, okay? To simplify things, ang pinaka-focus talaga ng batas na to is uh, really the fisheries and aquatic resources, okay? And uh, what the law provides specifically, tong act na to, this law, okay, 
what it's it's providing is it's providing for the development management and conservation of these uh, things that I mentioned, uh, this, this focus, this fisheries and aquatic resources. As I said earlier, uh, this law is essentially the primary law on fisheries and aquatic resources here in the Philippines. Um, an important point uh, about this law is in terms of its uh, you know reasoning as to why it was uh, put in place is so that it can respond to to can respond to and address uh, it all trends of blind resource exploitation uh, I'm not sure if that uh, is uh, readily evident but sinasabi nothing blind resource exploitation what we're talking about really is yung parang sigi sigi lang without any consideration for the consequences of our action as it relates to paggamit ng resources. In this case, yung fisheries and aquatic resources. Yung sige sige lang tayo, fish lang tayo ng fish, you know, um, getting more than what we need, doing things that we're not supposed to be doing, but, uh, you know, without really, you know, we're doing it without regard really to the possible consequences. We're doing it blindly. So, that's what's really being discussed here when we say, when it's being, you know, when you refer to it as a blind resource exploitation, okay? Um, it also aims to address an important uh, point uh, and an important connection, really. Kasi itong issue of uh, resource degradation, yung, yung nadidiminish yung uh, types, amounts of fishes and whatnot, may direct connection yan sa poverty eh. um, and uh, you know rightly so kasi kung isipin mo talaga ang Pilipinas um, you know it's a uh, archipelago uh, with over 7,000 islands 7,100 islands so ang, ang malaking uh, resource that we depend on uh, is the resource that is given to us by the ocean um, and uh, because of that, uh, a good percentage of the people depend on the ocean for its livelihood. So naturally, kung medyo depleted or degraded or uh, yun, wala na masyadong available resource, then it's going to have an impact on prosperity and of course, it could also mean poverty. Um, so yun, ang idea here in this law is to try and address it aims to try and address yung issue, the long issues na yun, the, the way they're connected, the nexus between the two, the connection. Okay, so uh, that is one of the intents or one of the aims of this law. Uh, finally, uh, it also sets a national policy on uh, sustainable use of uh, fishery resources um, to meet the growing food needs of the population. So uh, let's take a look exactly as to what the law says about uh, its uh, policy when you know uh, let, let's take a look at the declaration of policy in the law okay so there are a number of things that it says I'm just paraphrasing okay so in essence the first thing it says on the policy when it when the law made the declaration is uh, it's aimed to achieve food security okay and what, is re what it's referring to really is food security in order to provide the food needs of the population. Okay, so um, it has to also take into account in, in its uh, aim to deliver on that, okay, to provide the food needs of the population. What it has to take into consideration are a number of factors, uh, factors that are not necessarily controllable, but factors that uh, we should all be aware of. One, young trends, young changes, demographic changes uh, for fishes, okay? Pati yung mga emerging trends in uh, the trade of fish. Yung kasi there are times na mas mabenta itong type ng isang to and then before you know it, hindi na kasing benta ng iba. Uh, so parang uso-uso, panapanahon kumbaga. So that's what it's talking about when we're talking about emerging trends in the trade of fish as well as aquatic resources, okay? At hindi lang sa domestic market, that also applies to international markets because, syempre, you know, uh, being that the Philippines, or at least the oceans or the bodies of water 
surrounding it are very rich in uh, you know fisheries um, there's a high demand for for it internationally Kaya nga, uh, you know this emerging trends in the trade uh, plays a role plays on you know it could play into uh, you know these this this, this uh, uh, food security that we're talking about okay and siempre there is also the traditional um, law on you know the law of supply and demand that's that's also a factor that needs to be taken into consideration <clears throat> so yun, so when we're talking about this first uh, policy you know uh, the policy to achieve food, sec food security in order to provide the needs of the population the food needs of the population you know it has to you know take into consideration some of those factors that i mentioned okay what else is there um and the policy it also <clears throat> um, points out the aim to limit access to the fishery and aquatic resources okay and its first um, uh, first uh, plan to make that happen is to limit uh, who has exclusive use and enjoyment and it's of course giving that this law is giving that to the Filipino citizens okay so uh, you might you might wonder then eh, but you ma Foreigners, diba? they go to uh, Dampa, and why are they able to buy fish? Diba nga, sabi nito ng law na to, as a policy, you know, it's uh, the fishes, uh, those resources in the ocean are exclusively for Filipino citizens, for the use and enjoyment of Filipino citizens. Well, um, when in cases like that, you have to keep in mind that the fish has to be quote-unquote fished out of the ocean, right? And what the fisherman does with it okay that's up to him he could either consume it or he can sell it okay but nonetheless in terms of who has first dibs kung sino yung may exclusive use and enjoyment in fishing that those quote-unquote fishes out fishes out the fish but it's redundant pero um is really the filipinos so that's that's what this is really talking about okay to limit access to the fishery and aquatic resources of the philippines for the exclusive use and enjoyment of Filipino citizens. Okay, all right. What else? To ensure the national and sustainable development, management, conser conservation of the fishery and aquatic resources in the Philippine waters. Okay, to ensure the rational and sustainable development. Okay, we discussed sustainable a few times in uh, the last module, and just to reiterate, when we say sustainable, sinasabi natin dito renewable, diba? So something that, you know, if it's consumed, there has to be a way for it to regenerate, okay? So um, yung policy says that there has to be some means to ensure that, okay? There has to be some means to ensure that it's sustainable, the development, management, and conservation of the fisheries, uh, okay? And of course, rational, when we say rational, yung, it makes sense, diba? Hindi yung walang sense but you know that the uh, approach uh, to ensuring um, the sustainable development is also that it's rational that it makes sense okay what else to protect the rights of fisher folks okay and just to be clear my definition tayo or the law has a definition this specific law has a definition as to what a fisher folk is okay it says it's uh, re it's referring to people directly or personally and physically engaged in taking and or culturing and processing fish fishery and or aquatic resources so medyo sex self-explanatory na yan these are the yung mga manggagawa kumbaga i don't know if you could use that term for fishermen but yung mga you know average person that you know really survives off the ocean i think that's precisely what is being defined here when we say fisher folk okay so again, uh, one of the policies is to protect the rights of those people, the fisher folk. All right, moving on. To provide support to the fishery sector, major self-explanatory I don't think we really need to uh, discuss that in, in greater detail. Okay, and uh, let's move on. To manage fishery and aquatic resources. Okay. Um, to manage fishery and aquatic resources okay so um, 
uh, it's a major complex so, so maybe we'll just discuss it later if, if it uh, if it warrants it in when we talk about uh, what the law provides so um, all right let's just move on okay to grant the private sector the privilege to utilize fishery resources so um, this also is uh, self-explanatory um, so it's really referring to yung mga negosyante, the private sector. Um, so it's not just limited to yung mga regular na, you know, regular fisher folk, but uh, you know the law also, the law also um, has a, as a policy aims to grant to those mga negosyante, the private sector, uh, the, the same privilege given privileges that are given to fisher folk in, in being able to use. The fishery resources okay all right so moving on um, in terms of the scope of um, scope of this uh, this law um, it is really uh, covering three different aspects the first one as it relates to territory it is uh, the law covers essentially everything Essentially, all Philippine waters. So when we're talking about the territorial scope, the territorial reach ng batas na to, it's all Philippine waters. Okay, and uh, just to clarify as to what's included in that, kasama jan yung sure yung mga too big uh, where the Philippines has sovereignty and jurisdiction. Okay, um, and not only that, there's also um, the waters within the uh, Exclusive economic zone, the 200 nautical miles. Um, so, kait na medyo malayulu yun nasa from uh, the foreshore of the Philippines. As long as it's within the 200 nautical miles, um, then it's considered to be Philippine waters. Okay. Uh, not included on this uh, summary, uh, pero ang uh, naisali jan actually as uh, being part of the Philippine waters. Uh, actually, they didn't include it as a Philippine water, but it's also kind of covered. I think it may have been on the earlier policy. But anyway, it talks about the uh, uh, high seas. And uh, when it made mention of the high seas, it's really talking about the obligation of the Philippines and protecting okay, the obligation of sh actually sharing that obligation with our neighbors you know, in the Philippines of protecting, it, conserving, developing and managing those fisheries and aquatic resources in those areas so kahit na medyo outside of our outside of the philippine waters as defined here in this scope um may obligation pa rin ang pilipinas in ensuring that those uh, resources those fisheries and aquatic resources in high seas even if they're outside of the philippine waters but you know parang you know, in those areas, uh, medyo nagbo border with uh, you know with its neighbors. The Philippines has some responsibilities in uh, in protecting and, and so forth uh, all all those resources in those areas. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, okay, outside of the territorial uh, scope, uh, it, the Philippines uh, also has. Um, at least this law also has also covers not just the territorial aspects but uh, here it's uh, all aquatic and fishery resources whether they're inland coastal or offshore fishing areas and it includes uh, although not limited to fish ponds fish pens and cages so hindi lang yung mga aquatic and fishery resources um, on coastal areas, you know, offshore, you know, the, the ones that we just talked about, but also you know, inland, you know, the ones in fish ponds, fish pens, cages, etc. So, um, and in fact, well, uh, uh, not a fish pond, but a big body of water, you know, Laguna de Bay, uh, that's probably a good example. And we'll talk about that when we get to lesson two, okay? So, but nonetheless, the law covers um, that aspect, okay? All lands devoted to aquaculture or businesses and activities relating to fishery, whether private or public lands. 
What the heck is aquaculture? Uh, well, we have a definition. No, has that definition for it. It is uh, fishery operations involving all forms of raising and culturing fish and other fishery species in fresh, brackish, and marine water areas. Okay, so parang ano lang to yung um, what do you call it? Uh, fish farming. Uh, that's what I, I guess aquaculture is a much nicer, perhaps a more scientific term for it. But in essence, uh, it really is just the same as uh, you know, fish farming. You know, I, I think that's what's commonly used. Uh, yung mga bangus farms. <laughs> uh, so that that's what it all really is. Okay. So now that we know exactly what this law is about, let's uh, dive right in and look to see exactly how it provides for the development, management, and conservation of the fisheries and aquatic resources. So essentially what we're going to look to do is try to understand how this law provides, okay? So the very basic answer really is that it provides by regulating or putting some controls on the utilization, management, development, and conservation of these resources. So what kind of controls are we talking about? Well, controls as it relates to, for example, uh, the use of Philippine waters. An example of the kind of control that you might find there, uh, and it, this is something that we've already discussed earlier, is the uh, who, who specifically may be able to use Philippine waters. We said earlier that uh, the law made it so only Filipino citizens have exclusive use and enjoyment of Philippine waters. Um, so that's kind of a, I guess you can say, at, well, that's a good example of the control that uh, we're talking about here. Um, now, there is an exception to the uh, Philippine, Filipinos only. Uh, the law does provide that uh, in cases of research, uh, non-Filipinos uh, may partake, but there are some tight controls on that as well. Okay, so what other areas might we find controls? Okay, uh, let's see, okay, access to fishery resources. Uh, uh, a control we, we, that we might find here is uh, f uh, in the number of licenses and permits that uh, may be issued uh, for the conduct, conduct of uh, you know, fishing or fishery activities. Um, so, you know, uh, that's the kind of control that we might find when we're referring to access uh, into fishery resources. And uh, another interesting uh, control uh, which uh, looks fairly self-explanatory just based on the term itself, catch sealing. Um, what that is referring to is the maximum number of fishes. Uh, you know, it sets the limits or the quota on the total quantity of fish that, you know, one person can capture. What else? Well, there's also, uh, you know, just to give, um, you know, time for regeneration so that fish can spawn. Um, there are also controls on when uh, one could fish. Uh, you know, the law provides some limits on when fishing is allowed and when is considered uh, close season for fishing. What else is there? Uh, okay, uh, well, there's also instances where uh, foreign aquatic species may need to be introduced. And, uh, of course, in cases like that, the law ensures that uh, it has no detrimental effect on the environment and other species thus there is a need to have controls okay and uh, in addition to that there's uh, the need of course uh, uh, to protect uh, your more rare threatened and endangered species okay so additional things okay EIS or the environmental impact statement. Uh, this is not the first time you're hearing this. This is something that exists actually uh, in uh, pretty much any undertaking involving a possible effect uh, to the environment. Um, you might recall when we were talking about uh, mining, uh, well, I don't know if I mentioned it there, but I, I, I know I mentioned it uh, at a later, and I think in module one I mentioned the EIS. Um, so anyway, uh, in mining, of course, it's necessary to uh, obtain an EIS. And, and I'm referring to an organization, an entity, or a company 
that might be looking to undertake a, a project uh, which uh, may have the potential for affecting, you know, at least in mining, uh, it may have the, uh, you know, the possible effect of affecting uh, uh, protected areas, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, here, naman, uh, since we're talking about the uh, resources, the fishery resource and aquatic resources, um, we're talking about projects that may have an impact on uh, on the on on the fisheries and aquatic resources. So, uh, there is a definite need for any organization that is looking to undertake any activities or projects. Uh, there is a need for them to first uh, conduct an environmental impact statement or a study. Uh, and the output is the statement, and that's something that is submitted for review and for approval. And as I said before, you might recall, uh, medyo maduguto. It's kind of a, a very uh, intensive process, uh, considering the consequence. If you know, if there is an e effect, the consequence could be detrimental to the environment. So it's very important that this is done meticulously. Okay. So in addition to the EIS, uh, actually as part of the EIS. When an organization who uh, is to be uh, who is to undertake an activity or a project, uh, if his environmental impact statement is approved, uh, the proof of that uh, that would allow him to proceed with this project is the environmental compliance certificate. So that's a a must-have um, for anybody that is looking to undertake any project, okay, involving the possible effect of the environment. Okay, what else? The law also provides some controls and measures in the monitoring, uh, surveillance, and control of fishing. Okay, um, this is a, actually a system that uh, would uh, have to have been initially established by the DNR, and uh, it is uh, in coordination with the local government units. The farms. Well, let's explain what that F R A, F A R M C S are. Okay, they're the Fisheries and Aquatic Resources Management Councils. I will not discuss them here, but uh, because there's a separate section where we'll talk a little bit about what that is, uh, uh, what constitutes um, the council, and what is its powers. Okay. So anyway. Um, the coordination uh, the DNR has to have uh, when it comes to monitoring, surveillance, and controlling fishing uh, not only involves involves not only LGUs, the local government units, but also the fisheries and aquatic resource management councils, and uh, just the same, the private sector, as well as other concerned agencies. So besides the regulations, or in this case, the controls in the utilization, management, development, and conservation of fisheries and aquatic resources, this law also provides by giving the uh, local government, namely the municip municipality or the city government, um, some jurisdiction, some control over um, the management, development, and conservation of fisheries and aquatic resources. So let's go over some of these jurisdictions just to give us an idea of uh, the extent by which this law provides such jurisdiction. Okay, so let's start with the first. Um, essentially, the law gives the municipality and the city government um, overall um, basically control over municipal waters. When I say control, I'm again referring to the development, management, and conservation. So this uh, control or this authority over these municipal waters is uh, in coordination. So it's not just the LGU, but it's the LGU in coordination with the Fisheries and Aquatic Resources Management Councils. Okay. Another uh, jurisdiction granted the municip municipality and the city government is the ability to grant fishing privileges okay um, so the privileges are generally only granted to fisher folk organizations cooperatives and the like uh, since uh, well that they're not really the only one but they, they generally have the uh, uh, you know they're f they have first dibs they, they have they shall have the preference uh, and the grant of uh, these fishery rights okay so 
Uh, that's what this is talking about. And again, the grant is something that the LGU has the authority to give uh, to these fisher folk and the corresponding or the fisher folk uh, organizations and cooperatives. Okay, what else? Um, there is a central registry uh, of fisher folks. Okay, that the LGU is mandated by law to maintain. Okay. Um, so the idea here is to maintain a list of uh, those um, you know who are either fishing or may have a desire to fish in these municipal waters um, and by having them registered uh, the idea or the purpose really is that of determining priorities among them okay um, and of course this is limited only to municipal waters that which the uh, municipality or the city has jurisdiction over okay there is also for support for municipal uh, fisher folk, okay, uh, DNR in coordination with the local government, okay, um, provides support for these municipal fisher folk. Um, and the kind of support that they provide is generally like technology, research. Uh, they also give some credits, um, uh, production and marketing assistance, and other. Uh, like kind services um, uh, but it's not limited to training for additional or supplementary livelihood in other words it's more than just training for uh, livelihood or uh, supplementary livelihood but uh, the other things that I also mentioned okay uh, the law also um, essentially spells out the rights and privileges of fish workers so that's the fish folk, fisher po folks uh, in a sense, but uh, this generalizes, it talks about fish workers, okay? Um, they're entitled to particular privileges that are um, generally provided under the labor code, okay, uh, the social security system, and other benefits under other laws or social legislation for, for any kind of worker. Now, this law also allows for a number of things, uh, thus it has provisions for regulati regulating these things. So, uh, what, it, what exactly uh, are these additional things that it allows? Uh, let's take a look. So, there's a number of them, but uh, let me focus in on, I think I focused on three, uh, three, three of them here. Uh, the first one is commercial fishing, okay? And what we're talking about here, uh, as to what this law regulates relative to commercial fishing, is the need to be licensed in order to operate uh, any of the vessels whether it's a commercial fishing, fishing vessel, vessel a pearl fishing vessel or even one just for a vessel just for scientific research or educational purposes uh, there is uh, the law requires that uh, to operate those vessels uh, you know there must be a license one must be licensed okay? uh, in addition to license uh, for the operation of these vessels, there is also need to obtain a license <clears throat> uh, to engage in any of the uh, fishery activities. Okay, so not just to operate the vessels, but to actually engage in the operations or in the actual uh, fishery activity. Okay, um, moreover, uh, the need to uh, even seek employment. Um, uh, as a fish worker uh, that also needs a license okay so basically what we're talking about here are fish workers that would be working for a uh, an outfit that does commercial fishing so their work could you know, potentially involve uh, uh, fishing actually doing the net fishing uh, and by the way here in the Philippines uh, I think what is mostly used or allowed by DFAR uh, in so far as net fishing is concerned, is uh, the one referred to as pa paalin. Okay, uh, apparently that's the one that is uh, uh, safer to use. It does not cause any kind of destruction to the corals. Okay, so anyway, uh, that's the fish worker that we're referring to. Those that are involved in commercial commercial fishing and are thus the same that also need to obtain a license from BFAR. Uh, before they can seek employment 
okay, in the, among the, with these uh, outfits. There is also a need to register um, the vessels and the gear. So even the paaling nets uh, are subject to registration, much the same as the vessels I mentioned earlier, you know, the, uh, uh, the actual commercial fishing vessel, the pro fishing vessel, or even the, the one that is used for scientific research or educational purposes. Those all need to be registered, okay? Lease of uh, fish ponds and registration of fish hatcheries and private fish uh, ponds. Let's start with the lease of fish uh, lease of fish ponds. What is being refer referred to here really is uh, public lands uh, that is uh, no longer being used for any purpose, but is suited or suitable um, for uh, aquaculture. Uh, and uh, being that that's the case, the government can then make it available as a fish pond that could be leased out under a fish pond lease agreement okay um, fish hatcheries naman what we're talking about there are facilities where fish could be hatched okay uh, or bred okay and of course private fish ponds um, are self-explanatory now what, what uh, we're talking about when we're talking about these uh, hatcheries as well as the private fish ponds uh, these two need to be registered uh, with the local government unit uh, since the local government unit in the municipal waters uh, or you know in the municipality um, would be the ones who have jurisdiction uh, over these uh, facilities okay um, uh, another item that is included in the provision importation and exportation of fishery products of no noteworthy mention is um, um, the allowance uh, uh, for exportation. Uh, generally, uh, uh, exportation of live fish is prohibited. Okay, um, it is only allowed uh, in cases where the fish that are to be exported are those that are hatched at accredited hatcheries and ponds. Okay. Uh, in addition, there is also a consideration as to how such exportation might affect food security. Uh, you might recall earlier in this presentation we were talking about food security. So you might recall the different uh, considerations there. Uh, you know the uh, uh, you know, considerations on trade, the uh, law of supply and demand, you know, all of all of those things. Anything that can affect the, essentially the food security. Okay. So again, for exportation purposes before uh, such uh, uh, fishery products may be allowed um, there is also a need to determine uh, how it might affect the food security okay moving on all right so okay in addition to those um, in addition to those uh, um, regulations the uh, three that I mentioned um, what is also provided in this law um, as a means to effectively provide for the development, management, and conservation of the fisheries and aquatic resources, um, it, the, the law actually reconstituted the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, the BFAR, Okay, And in reconstituting, this is what it did. Okay. First, it created a um, uh, position an Undersecretary for Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. Uh, this position is under the uh, Department of Agriculture, which uh, in fact BFAR is under, um, and the, per the person that would hold this position is a uh, presidential appointee. Okay, And uh, his responsibility is solely to attend to the needs of the fishing industry. Okay, So that's the function of this USEC. Uh, secondly, I mentioned already that BFAR is uh, under the Department of Agriculture and is uh, essentially the primary government agency on uh, uh, um, you know, fisheries and aquatic resources. Uh, they are, BFAR is a line bureau under the Department uh, of Agriculture. 
and it has a great deal of responsibility. Like I said, they are the primary government agency when it comes to the um, uh, development, management, and conservation of the fisheries and aquatic resources. They're the primary agency for that. Uh, uh, but you know, they have a whole lot of other responsibilities, uh, uh, quite a number to enumerate actually. But let me see if I can quickly mention a, a couple of them. Um, so uh, one of the things that they do is they prepare and implement a, uh, a national uh, plan uh, a national fisheries industry development plan. Um, they're also the same, and we kind of alluded to this earlier, they're the same that one would go to to get a license to operate a vessel, uh, you know, a commercial fish fishing vessel, or even the uh, license to, um, you know, to seek employment as a fish worker. They're the same agency or bureau that one needs to go to. Okay. Um, they are also responsible for doing uh, the monitoring and reviewing um, uh, fishing agreements okay, uh, between Filipino citizens and foreigners. Um, you know, because there are times when you know there is a um, uh, collaboration uh, involving Filipino citizens who, as you recall, uh, have the exclusive right to the use and enjoyment. Uh, fisheries and aquatic resources in Philippine waters, but you might also recall that there are um, waters outside of the Philippine uh, uh, waters that uh, uh, you know the Philippines has a responsibility and, ob and an obligation for, um, and just the same the neighbors would have a similar, if not the same, as obligations and responsibilities. So uh, there are cases when. Um, since it's high seas, it's nobody really owns it. You know, you can pretty much go there and fish. Um, there are instances where um, the neighboring countries, or at least the uh, some of the outfits on, you know, on both countries, would uh, uh, jointly come to an agreement on how they might conduct their fishing activities in those international waters. So, uh, in cases like that, BFAR uh, would be the agency that would take a look. Um, at the, and review those uh, agreements. An important point of mention, which uh, looks like I may have inadvertently omitted from my presentation, um, is in regards to with regard to the uh, functions of the of BFAR. Okay, um, this is actually somewhat relevant to the focus or the objective of this course. Um, since it kind of uh, provides a basis for identifying BFAR as a prospective uh, employer <laughs> if and when you decide to make the move to become a uh, environmental law enforcer. Okay? Uh, essentially what uh, I'm trying to say here is that among the responsibilities and functions of BFAR is of course the uh, responsibility of enforcing all laws uh, and uh, the formulating and enforcing of all rules and regulations, specifically those that govern the conservation and management of fishery resources. Okay, so that implies uh, a number of things, including investigative work. Um, naturally, that's part of enforcing laws. Okay, um, now. Uh, BFAR is part of the national govern government, so uh, you know naturally their jurisdiction is of uh, is national in character, um, which of course means that uh, in relation to uh, laws, local ordinances, that sort of thing, anything that pertains to the municipal waters, um, those are the only exception to um, the jurisdiction of BFAR in relation to this function of enforcing laws. Okay. Um, the uh, function of enforcing laws in municipal waters fall with the local government unit. Okay, so having said that, let's move forward and let's talk about the uh, uh, the councils. Uh, the law does provide um, a some, some provisions that uh, allow for the creation of uh, a number of councils. It's kind of a, a hierarchical of uh, type of uh, organization. So let's uh, let's talk about that. 
Let's start with the um, just the general council, the uh, Fisheries and Aquatic Resource Management Councils or Farm C. Okay, um, here's some general uh, information about these councils. Um, they're actually um, the byproduct of, in other words, they're formed by organizations and cooperatives, uh, fisher folk, okay? um, I, and uh, it also involves uh, NGOs in that same locality. Uh, and uh, you know, in order for them to form uh, these councils, they're uh, assisted by the local government unit as well as other government entities. Uh, it's not entitled, this is entity, so I misspelled there uh, this entry. Anyway, um, they are uh, established in, uh, as I said earlier, medyo may hierarchy. Um, they're not necessarily reporting to one another, but uh, there's different uh, councils for different levels of government, okay? Um, so this one, uh, you know, this general, fact about the council uh, speaks to the fact that there is one established at the national level as well in all municipalities slash cities, cities abutting municipal waters. Uh, of course when we say abutting in case uh, that's not a common word. Yeah. Um, that's what it really is just saying is uh, bordering. Abutting is another word for bordering. Was municipal waters. Okay so um, let's move forward. The third thing here that is of no, noteworthy mention is that uh, um, the formation or the, <clears throat> the process of organizing a council, um, there is a need for consultation and orientation, okay, um, that the LGUs, NGOs, and fisher folk and other concerned um, officials, public officials, must undergo. So that's an important point of mention. And this is before a uh, uh, council is formed, okay, or organized. So um, now let's talk about the mother of all Aquatic Resource, Aquatic Resources Management Councils. This is the National Fisheries and Aquatic Resources Management Council. Uh, um, I, I, again, I refer to it as the mother of all councils because uh, this is the bigger one. It's uh, it's the one that has uh, jurisdiction over the entire nation, naturally, because it's national. Uh, but it's also um, uh, noteworthy to mention that comprise uh, some of the big wigs in the uh, in, in, in the government as well as non-government entities okay uh, for example uh, the uh, this council this uh, national fisheries and aquatic resources management council is chaired by the uh, undersecretary of the Department of Agriculture uh, I, uh, the Undersecretary of the DILG is a member, uh, along with naturally the fisher folks and fish workers. Um, there is also there are also members of the academe that play in, and uh, also uh, since they also participate, they do participate in uh, many uh, fisheries related uh, matters. Uh, representatives from fisheries related NGOs. Okay. So, um, what do they do? Well, they, they have a number of things that they're responsible for uh, you know, in terms of what their function is, but a common one across the board is that they assist in the formulation of policies for the protection, sustainable development and management of fishery and aquatic resources. The only difference really is the extent of that policy. Naturally, since we're talking about the national, here, we're talking about the national Fisheries and Aquatic Resources Management Council, ang magiging scope ng plan nila or their policy, their uh, uh, the development plan and policy um, is uh, national. So it's the national policy 
for the protection, sustainable development, and management of fishery and aquatic resources. Also of note, noteworthy mention, which is also consistent across the board uh, insofar as the uh, purpose or the uh, uh, function of the, uh, these uh, councils. They serve as advisory uh, slash recommendatory bodies. Uh, and uh, in a few minutes, we'll provide some examples as to how how they fulfill that obligation or that, that role. Okay, let's move forward. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so this one now is uh, the council for the municipal slash city. Okay, that's why the acronym is M slash C Farm C. Okay, so it's a municipal slash city fisheries and aquatic resources management council. Okay, uh, again, they are uh, involved in the development, mainly in assisting the preparation of the fishery development plan. Uh, but unlike the national, which is focused on the national plan, um, this one is focused on its jurisdiction, which is the municipal municipality or city. So uh, what they're assisting with, uh, insofar as preparation is concerned, is the municipal fishery development plan. Okay, I said uh, as I said earlier, there this body, these councils provide as advisory recommendatory bodies. So here's an example of uh, exactly how they provide that function. Um, so here in the municipal, municipal level, they're also able to make recommendations uh, for the enactment of fishery ordinances in the municipality. Um, so uh, that's one of the functions that they're able to do unique to their jurisdiction. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now, Kanina, when I was talking about uh, one of the functions of BFAR, I mentioned that uh, you know the, the BFAR also enforces all laws, you know, all, all related laws, to fi fisheries related laws. Okay, uh, and the only exception are the municipal water. So uh, this is referring to the same thing. Okay. Um, in other words, uh, the people or the entities or the bodies that have jurisdiction over enforcing laws within the municipal waters are the local government units, the pertinent uh, personnel uh, within that, uh, you know, within, within that, um, that local government. Okay? And the council here provides assistance towards the cause of that body or that entity or those persons okay they assist in the enforcement enforcement of fishery laws rules and regulation regulations in municipal waters okay uh, here's another uh, advisory recommendatory uh, example an example of uh, their function in that area um, they do provide advisory uh, to the Sangguni and Bayan or Pandong Sod um, on uh, you know fishery related matters. Okay. An important note since we talked about the national and now the municipal and city, um, there is also one that could be created at the uh, parangay level, and it's something that can be created as necessary. Okay, um, and it's created. It could be created by the local government unit. Okay, it says here. Um, Anyway, uh, something that I took from the law, it says that the LGU may create the Barangay Fisheries and Aquatic Resources Management Councils and the lakes, Lakewide Fisheries and Aquatic Resource Management Councils whenever necessary. Okay, so as you can see there, as I said, there's multiple levels. They're not necessarily reporting to one another, but um, they differ only in um, their jurisdiction and slightly as to their function but in general they have the same advisory recommendatory function okay okay so uh, another council um, that is uh, uh, that can be created is the integrated fisheries and aquatic resources management council 
Um, this one doesn't refer to a particular uh, lo locality, not to a city, not to a municipality, uh, rather in terms of the types of bodies of waters. Okay, so in bays, gulfs, lakes, and rivers and dams bounded by two or more municipalities, especially. So uh, circumstances may call for the creation of a council uh, specific to that type of body. So the law provides that one can be created for that purpose, specifically for those bodies of water. Okay. So uh, the last thing um, that uh, the law provides because okay, we're again we're talking about what exactly are the things that this law provides in so far as development management and conservation of the fisheries and aquatic resources are concerned okay so we've talked uh, quite a bit about what we find in the law what the law provides a reminder of course that's not an exclusive uh, enumeration uh, it just we just pick and choose some relevant ones to give you an understanding of what this law provides, but there's a whole lot, a whole lot more that is provided. But then, anyway, uh, the last thing that I want to bring up in that list uh, is one that provides for prohibitions and penalties, and naturally this takes us to the uh, final um, part uh, in our lesson uh, that will focus on the prohibitions and penalties as provided by this law. So what are we going to find in this last part of this presentation, or us, of this lesson rather? Uh, this is where we're going to find essentially the list of uh, what the law criminalizes, the provisions that uh, are listed to be prohibited and thus penalized, and so this section answers the question of what acts are punishable, okay? So in looking at this law, uh, recall that the, this, this law was amended, but when it was first put into effect in 1998, there were 22 provisions, criminal provisions, 22 provisions that are considered criminal uh, and are thus prohibited and penalized, okay? And in that law, uh, the original law, RA 8550, before it was amended, you would find those 22 criminal provisions on section 86 to section 107. Now, when it was amended sometime in 2015, um, basically what happened was many of the provisions were um, criminal provisions were literally changed, they were amended, they were made uh, you know, to be clearer and since the purpose of the amendment was precisely to provide uh, for the prevention, deterrence and elimination of illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, uh, then uh, the bulk of what uh, we now will see under the amendatory law are precisely the uh, specific provisions that were amended, okay? And um, the other point I wanted to make is that besides amending the 22, it also, the amendatory law also added a few more. So um, in the amended, in the amendment, there are a total of 53 criminal provisions starting at section 86 up to one section 128 okay so uh, we're not gonna spend um, the time to go over all 53 uh, that would probably not be uh, a uh, productive use of our time especially considering how in the last uh, several laws that we've covered uh, we've pretty much uh, determined how we're going to use these provisions and I'm sure by now you've already mastered it. So there's no real necessity to go over each and every one of the provisions. But I do want to bring up um, one or a couple maybe um, that is that may, may be a little different from what we may have done in the past. 
something to kind of introduce, something new to introduce as to what you might want to look for when you're looking for elements, the elements of the effects. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, I'm, I'm referring in this case, well, there's one in particular that I want to refer to. And uh, that's the first uh, provision. Uh, it's section 86. Uh, this section has three paragraphs. And uh, the title itself already tells you pretty much that, uh, you know, what the element is, uh, the main element is. Okay? The title is Unauthorized Fishing. So naturally, fishing by itself is the app. And we all know that that is not illegal per se. There's nothing morally wrong to warrant it being an illegal act, okay? Uh, but there has to be something that would make it illegal. And that something is the unauthorized, you know, yeah, doing the fishing, yet you're not authorized to do so, okay? Uh, and that's still fairly broad. So naturally, we'll have to look at the provision of law. Anyway, looking at that first, par first paragraph, Medyo madali lang to. I mean, this first paragraph is consistent with the other uh, provisions that we've looked at. In other words, uh, when I say madali lang to, uh, we should be able to quickly answer the three questions just by reading it one time. Okay. Uh, first question, of course, is who uh, is the offender uh, who committed the act? Okay. And the second question is what is the act? And if that act by itself is not necessarily illegal, what exactly makes it illegal? Okay, so those are the three questions. So reading this first paragraph, we could already ascertain and quickly identify those three elements. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to read it anymore. I'm sure you've read it while I was talking. And here we could identify the first element, which is the offender. And that's any person. We could also quickly see, just because of the sequence, in w you know, the sequence in which the sentence is, uh, um, you know, organized. Uh, based on the sequence, we could already see the second element, which is the act. And the act is to capture or gather, blah 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 blah. Okay. And then lastly, uh, that act, uh, we could just by looking at it. Uh, almost uh, conclude na, you know by itself uh, is not illegal it's not there's nothing immoral or anything wrong with it that would constitute it as an illegal act there has to be something that would make it illegal and that is the qualifier that's the third question and again based on the sequence by which this sentence is organized we can see that that's the next phrase um, and that, and then, right, that, that next phrase tells us what the qualifier is, which is without license or permit from the department or LGU, okay? All right, so based on that, we can put that on our worksheet. And there you have it. Uh, the offender is any person. The act or omission is capture or gather or to cause the capture or gathering of fish, fry or fingerlings of any fishery species or fishery products. That's the act or omission. And what qualifies it as a crime is that it is done, that act is done without license or mit, permit from the department or the local government unit. All right? So now this uh, provision, section 86, there's three paragraphs here. So we were, you know, from the first paragraph, we could, we could again, we, we were quickly able to, you know, find the elements of the offense. Now let's see what the other paragraphs say, okay? Uh, the second paragraph, you'll see, uh, also seems to imply that there is some act that is criminal, that is unlawful, okay? So it's just one sentence, well, let's read it. It says, except in cases specified under this code, it shall, it shall also be unlawful for any commercial fishing vessel to fish in municipal waters, okay? So uh, based on the way this uh, sentence reads, okay, it is telling me anyway and maybe telling you also that as a general rule it shall be unlawful for any commercial fishing, fishing vessel to fish in municipal waters that's the general rule that's what it's telling me okay because the exception 
is the first part of the sentence. It says except. See, I mean, the fact that it even starts with the word except already tells you that it's an exception, which means that everything else that it said that's said after is the general rule. So again, the exception here is in cases specified under this code. So in other words, it's unlawful talaga siya in general, okay? And what is unlawful is you know the use of commercial fishing vessel to fish in municipal waters. Again, uh, the use of any commercial fishing vessel to fish in municipal waters. That's the act that is generally unlawful. And the exception would be if there's something in this law that says otherwise. Okay, and so we have to refer back to the provisions of law. And there is clearly at least one that provides that exception, okay? And it's section 18. Uh, section 18 talks about um, the, user, the users of municipal waters, okay? It essentially lays out who may be, who may be able to use the municipal waters, okay? And if you read that, it says that uh, the city government, the municipal or city government, okay, may through its local chief executives, that would be the mayor, and acting pursuant to an appropriate ordinance, so there must have been a law passed, okay, by the local Sanguinian, okay, okay, and that law should authorize or permit small and medium commercial fishing vessels. Remember, small and medium commercial fish fishing vessels to operate within 10.1, to 15 kilometers kilometer area from the shoreline in municipal waters as defined herein herein provided that all of the following are met so there's an additional criteria there okay so yeah I mean that that essentially says that uh, in general going back to the second paragraph in general unlawful talaga for a commercial fishing vessel to fish in municipal waters uh, except this is the exception as provided by this section okay uh, if it's a small and medium commercial fishing vessel and it operates within a particular distance from the shoreline and it meets all these other criteria and provided that that permit that license to uh, fish in municipal waters is provided by local law so all of those conditions have to be met all right so anyway uh, you could already tell from here uh, what the act is the act is the uh, commercial fishing vessel fishing in municipal waters okay and you could already tell what the qualifier is okay well I mean technically there is no qualifier because it's a general rule okay uh, but you can just specify uh, that unless there is a law and according to section 18 okay so you can maybe put on your worksheet okay that the qualifier is that is it's not in compliance with section 18 all the provisions of section 18 okay and the act is uh, um, you know uh, act of uh, fishing uh, using a commercial fishing vessel in municipal waters okay now notice this thing doesn't have uh, any indication as, as to who might be the offender so a major tricky to um, you know so conventional thinking you know we're talking about a commercial fishing ve vessel so, siguro, what ang naisip niyo would be the owner. Yeah, that's, that's possible. Uh, he could certainly be liable. Or maybe the operator or both. Okay? Or maybe even the complement. Okay? But one thing to make it possibly even easier is if we go to the third paragraph. Okay? I said the third paragraph says that, you know, any person who is discovered to be in possession of fishing gear or operating a fishing vessel okay in a fishing area where he has no license or permit okay is prima facie presumption that the person is engaged in unauthorized fishing okay prima facie presumption so parang you're concluding although it's rebuttable chempre, uh, but there's uh, just based on those facts and circumstance the conclusion is that this guy is committing an author unauthorized fishing so there is that presumption be it rebuttable but then the, the burden shifts to him to prove otherwise okay anyway that uh sentence that paragraph in relation to the second paragraph 
uh, kind of provides this, okay? So, yung second paragraph talks about, uh, you know, uh, general rule, um, it's lawful, but the exception is if there is a permit or a license provided by the local chief executive as provided by law uh, for, for as long as um, that uh, purse, that licensee, that permittee uh, complies with all of the terms of that license or permit, right? Okay, so that said, the other thing you uh, will want to consider also is when you're given a license, okay, the physical manifestation, that piece of paper, that ID, is not the license, okay? All that is is just a manifestation that you are given authority, right? The license is your compliance, okay? Your compliance to those terms, compliance to the law, okay? Well, whatever, like in this case, it says there has to be a law, right? Uh, we're talking about the exception on paragraph two. Uh, it says there has to be a law, and uh, and it's up to the uh, chief executive whether to issue it or not. And uh, you know, it has to be a small or medium-sized vessel, and the vessel could only operate at a certain distance from the, the foreshore, and all these other criteria. Okay, so the person that has that physical license okay um, that manifestation that he's licensed could actually do fishing in those areas provided that he is doing it within the confines of his license because that's what he was licensed for therefore if he is not in compliant if he for example violates the distance rule or instead of a small or medium vessel he is using a large vessel any anything that goes outside the bounds of that license okay is tantamount to no license right because he has no license to operate a large vessel because the license he has only allows him to operate a small or medium vessel so therefore he has no license right so that said you now go to the third paragraph okay the third paragraph says there's prima facie presumption you know when somebody's operating a vessel or uh, in possession of uh, fishing gear and he has no license or permit right so again if you have a physical license but what you're doing is outside about the bounds of the license you you have no license therefore okay you are presumed uh to be committing unauthorized fishing so there you have it so anyway i just wanted to share that uh, because that's how i would translate it as an investigator okay you're presented with certain facts and circumstance similar to this uh, uh, provision for perhaps and you're now having to refer to this provision to see if there is indeed a violation if there is indeed unauthorized fishing and you know the first uh, paragraph here was easy okay um, we know our, we already know how to do that okay the second paragraph was a little tricky but I think since it's only one sentence and we can quickly ascertain that the general rule is it's unlawful and as an exception, you have to look at other provisions of this law to see uh, where it might be allowed, okay? And uh, if it is allowed, what are the instances where it is allowed, okay? So anyway, uh, Yun, so this, this, what I just uh, went through basically is a kind of a way to just uh, analyze the provisions of law when you're confronted with this kind of situation. Uh, hopefully this makes sense. Uh, it's unfortunate we uh, are not uh, given the opportunity to personally interact. Because I think this is a very interesting discussion, you know, like a real face-to-face -face discussion. Uh, you may have some additional thoughts about this, additional perspective, but this is how I would translate this provision, you know. And uh, what I want to impart basically is that you know you, you have to sort of think outside of the box or rather just you know be careful at analyzing uh, and seeing how it might help you in your investigations because sometimes what you see on the surface is you know not necessarily it you know it's uh you have to kind of analyze it to see if there's something there that really means something different okay so anyway uh, as i said we're not going to go through the remaining uh, 52 provisions uh, I'm gonna let you do that on your own like I did the last one. You already have an idea of how to create a simple worksheet uh, to help you identify the elements, you know, those three questions. 
Uh, again, I would encourage you, like I have always been in the last uh, lessons, to try and uh, analyze those provisions yourself. Yourself, okay? Um, you don't. I mean, it's it's up to you, but I I don't think it's completely essential at this point to really look at every single provision of the entire law, as long as you have a general idea as to what the law is about. Okay? What I think is important at this. What I think is important at this point. Uh, considering your, um, you know, where, where you're wanting to go, uh, you know, where you're wanting, you know, you, you want to be a uh, environmental law uh, law enforcer with some investigative work, then I think, you know, it's it's probably more uh, practical at this stage to, you know, kabisa uh, duhin, so to speak, how how the criminal provisions are put together and how you might be able to quickly ascertain what the elements are, okay? So uh, that said, I, again, I would encourage you um, do, do it on your own. Um, and look at these provisions and uh, go from there, okay? So that said, I think we are done at this point with lesson one. Uh, we are now ready to go to lesson number two under Blue Laws. Hey there, welcome back. We are still uh, studying uh, the module on Blue Laws, the second module in the series. And uh, we have actually just completed lesson one. So let's set that aside and uh, let's now focus on the second and last lesson under Blue Laws. Uh, this time around, uh, the law that we will look, look into is the law that created the Laguna Lake Development Authority. So it's the uh, 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 law. Um, uh, referred to as the Laguna Lake Development Authority Act or RA 4850 as amended. Okay, um, So besides creating the Laguna Lake Development Authority or LLDA, it also prescribed or provided for uh, the powers of the LLDA including its functions and duties. So in terms of uh, purpose, uh, tells us that uh, it is, you know, the purpose of this is to promote and accelerate the development and balanced growth of uh, the lake itself uh, and uh, also all of the areas surrounding the lake, the provinces, cities, and towns, okay? And uh, this uh, approach or this uh, objective of promoting and accelerating um, involves or is based on rather on the national and regional plans and policies for social economic development okay uh, specifically for the area that we talked about the uh, Laguna Lake itself as well as the surrounding areas the provinces towns and cities okay um, and uh, in terms of um, you know how uh, you know what 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 it covers um, you know, this means of promoting an acceleration, it is to include measures that uh, are for environmental management and control, okay, uh, preservation of undue ecological dis disturbances, um, deterioration, and pollution, okay. So, a lot of what we're saying here seems a little um, blurry for now. Um, Major may not may have got flowery legalistic words and phrases that are being used here, um, but I think the easiest thing to just keep in mind as to the purpose of this law in love is that it's uh, purposed on promoting and accelerating the development and balanced growth of the Laguna Lake area and the surrounding provinces, cities, and towns. Okay, so uh, that's the baseline understanding of what what uh, is the law all about okay uh, you know the next question of course is that uh, ano lake na to? Well, what is this body of water you know why is it so significant that it would require a law to create uh, an agency just so you know it can uh, effectively promote and accelerate um, its efforts um, you know wh why not yung sapa uh, that you know uh, runs uh, alongside the border of, say, Marikina and Rizal. Uh, why not those small bodies of water or other bodies of water? 
Okay, why why this one? What is so significant about this? Okay, so in order for us to learn the answers, uh, natin by looking at exactly where this uh, body of water is. So let's pull up um, the map of the Philippines. <clears throat> and uh, what we know, of course, is that uh, this body of water is in the Luzon area. And it's right about there. I've circled it on the map. You can see it. And if we zoom in on this map, okay, we will see that this body of water is adjacent to Manila Bay. So on this picture, you'll see where Manila Bay is. It's that opening, okay, right about, it's almost like at the center of this picture okay now uh, to the left of Manila Bay and if we're looking at it it'll be on the right side of course uh, there is this uh, seemingly heart-shaped um, configuration it's colored green on this picture but um, that's essentially the Laguna Lake um, you know they characterize it as being heart-shaped so you know just based on this you'll also see where it's at and why it's considered to look like a heart shape. Um, but me personally, I, I don't think it looks like a heart. Um, I think it looks more like the head of Wiley Coyote. Uh, I don't know if you'll agree or not, but anyway, uh, I think one reason why I see it that way, well, there's two reasons, but uh, primarily, uh, see, Wiley Coyote is one of my favorite cartoon characters since I was growing up in the U.S. Uh, He's a very determined, uh, you know, uh, a very determined rascal, if you will. <laughs> um, that you know, essentially, all of his life, you know, he's decided that he's no matter what, he's gonna catch, you know, whatever it takes, he's gonna catch a road runner. Okay, I mean, he, I don't know where he gets his money, but he is able to order all kinds of explosives and gadgets and machineries from the Acme catalog. He's really very, very determined, but unfortunately, it seems like his efforts are futile, you know, that uh, he, it's hopeless, that he'll never, that he will never ever catch, no matter what, he'll never ever catch the Roadrunner. So kind of like what I, uh, well, this is probably why I can sort of relate, uh, you know, uh, he is to Roadrunner as I am to Pagpamahal. <laughs> okay, anyway, ito, medyo lumalabas na yung hugot. Uh, joke lang yan. Um, and it's just a sh brief commercial just to kind of uh, shift things a little bit. Uh, konting kwento rin, uh, since we're sort of on a, off on a tangent, just a konting uh, kwento. Uh, among the things that we've done in the past, that I've done in the past, involve uh, uh, also uh, teaching or lecturing uh, for uh, college students and uh, you know th this unfortunately environment loss is not one of the more it's not it's not an exciting or a sexy subject uh, if anything you know when when they started to discuss or lecture trafficking in persons even if it's a crime even if it's a horrendous crime I think just the very nature it, you know the, the fact that it's a sexual nature is you know, very appealing to, uh, you know, pu puberty-aged college students. So, medyo nakasanayan kong gumawa ng mga kalokohan when I am having to discuss a subject that is otherwise extremely boring to them. So, and that's the reason why medyo nagka-commercial ako dito. Anyway, I hope you were amused by it. Uh, nonetheless, so uh, let's get uh, a little bit more serious now. But uh, one last thing before we proceed. You'll notice in, in this map, uh, just below uh, Laguna Bay uh, and on this picture it's right behind um, the tail or the butt <laughs> of Wiley Coyote there's this dark uh, silhouette uh, it looks it looks very familiar uh, and the silhouette almost looks like Bart Simpson <laughs> uh, and pretty much as uh, sensitive probably as <laughs> at least that, that's a body of water so it's um, it's uh, kind of a, a sensitive area, uh, probably as sensitive as part in that, uh, as I'm sure you'll remember, uh, Ta'al Lake, where the Ta'al Volcano is, um, was victim to uh, the wrath 
of the volcano. Even if it wasn't a massive explosion, you might recall early this year in January, we were uh, confronted with, uh, you know, what he has he has to say. Uh, he spewed uh, lava up in the air, or at least ashes up in the air. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to throw that out. So now that you have a general idea of where it's at, and, and what, that's also one of the reasons why I brought up the Tal Lake, so you, you, you have a frame of reference as to where exactly the um, Laguna Lake is. Um, so now that you do have a frame of reference, uh, I think we can now proceed to discuss why this body of water is so important enough, that, uh, or at least significant enough, that it would warrant all of this attention. So let's talk about the characteristics that make this lake a significant body of water. Okay, but before we dive right in, I think it's uh, um, worthwhile discussing what is the right way to refer to this lake. You may have seen some materials or some documents refer to it as Laguna de Bay, and of course, uh, like in this law it's referring to it, to it as Laguna Lake. So which is the right way to refer to this lake? Uh, let's give a little bit of a history first as to why there are those two uh, names for this lake or two references for this lake. Let's start with Laguna de Bay. Okay. Laguna de Bay, de Bay um, is actually based on the, the town of Bay, which is in Laguna. Okay. It's in the southern part of the bay or rather the, the lake. It's, uh, again, the town's name is Bai. Okay? During the time when Bai was the provincial capital, that was when they named the lake after that provincial capital uh, called Bai, that town called Bai. All right? And Laguna, of course, in Spanish means lake. So Laguna de Bai, lake of uh, the town of Bai. Okay? So that's why it was referred to as Laguna de Bay. Over time, uh, Laguna Lake became a common reference to it, and it wasn't an attempt, it was not an attempt to translate Laguna de Bay because then, if that was the case, uh, it, should, it, it should be by Lake, right? Uh, instead, uh, what is being referred to when it's being called Laguna Lake is the province of Laguna, okay? So, Laguna as the province, lake as the body, body of water, the type of water, body of water that is in, in the province of Laguna. Okay, so Laguna Lake. Uh, anyhow, uh, those two references, uh, references to this lake, the, way, the two ways that uh, this lake is being referred to are both correct. They, you know, there are some uh, materials to this day, maps and whatever, that refer to this body of water as Laguna de Bay. A uh, more current um, reference to it that you may see, uh, example, this law refers to it as Laguna Lake. So, for our purpose, since we're discussing this law that refers to it as Laguna Lake, that is also how we're going to proceed to refer to it. Okay, so let's move on. Let's talk about the characteristics that uh, make this lake significant. Okay. Let's talk about its uh, size, uh, and we're talking about geographic size, okay? Uh, to start, this lake is being referred to as a shallow freshwater basin, okay? It's a basin because uh, the definition of a basin is that of a depression or a dip in the, earth, uh, in, the earth, in the surface of the earth, okay? It's at a low point in the earth uh, or in the surface of the earth. Um, such that many things will flow to it, like fluids or liquids, okay? Um, so it's a basin in that regard, all right? And it just so happens that what is flowing to it, what it is catching, um, is uh, water. And what kind of water? Fresh water. Tabang tubig, right? Uh, not the salt water, but fresh water. Uh, and it's coming from different sources, tributaries, rivers, and whatnot. So uh, it seems it seems kind of familiar because when when uh, in uh, in our last lesson when we talked about a um, a type of catch 
for water, an aggregation uh, place where water is aggregated to, and that's uh, watershed. And in a way, this basin is a lot like a watershed. Actually, it's a watershed, but uh, it's the large, it's a large uh, watershed. It doesn't exactly have the same characteristics as watershed, but in so far as its purpose of or uh, its eventual use as a collection, as a collector of water, it's it serves the same or it has the same characteristics as a watershed. So in a way, it's a watershed. Uh, although uh, this basin, um, Laguna Bay. Uh, also have has a number of watersheds that collect uh, water from various rivers and tributaries that empty into the Laguna Lake okay so that's why it's uh, a freshwater basin but it is referred to as a shallow freshwater basin because of this even if at its at, at its deepest the depth is uh, Actually, it's pretty deep. It's 20 meters deep. That's at its deepest point. Even if that's the case, um, the average depth, you know, because obviously there's different uh, depth in different parts, but if you were to average at all, it would only average to two and a half meters. That's about nine feet deep. So that's the average depth. And that's why it's being referred to as a shallow freshwater basin, Lababa, and it's not that deep, okay? In terms of the surface area, <clears throat> uh, it covers quite a broad area, uh, 900, approximately 900 square kilometers of surface area. That's what it covers. So, okay. uh, in terms of uh, average volume of water, it can hold an average of 2,250,000 cubic meter. That is a lot of water. Okay, so given this uh, summary of its uh, size, there, you know, um, it's pretty obvious, or at least it explains why it is recognized as the largest lake in the Philippines. And not only in the Philippines, but throughout Asia, it is among the largest, the third, in fact, the third largest throughout Asia. So it's fairly significant as to its size, okay? So as to its uh, reach within the Philippines, you know, in its locality, uh, how far does it reach? That's the next question. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the shoreline. If I was to go to one of the shorelines in, the, in this uh, lake and, and I was to walk along that shoreline, um, the whole, the entire lake itself where I start at one point and I end up in the same point okay if I did that I would have walked 285 kilometers okay so that's a pretty pretty long distance okay and this 285 kilometers of shoreline you'll find this uh, these shorelines in about 217 barangays that they are referring to as shoreline barangays these 217 barangays are in 29 municipalities and these 29 min municipalities are in three provinces that border, that provide the border, uh, the borders uh, to this lake, okay? Uh, the three uh, provinces are Laguna, Rizal, and NCR, which is not a, uh, not, not a province per se, but it's a region, okay? Anyway, in Laguna, there are 18 of these municipalities, Rizal, there's Tain. And in the national capital region, there's two, all right? Uh, and as I said, um, you know, it's bordered by provinces of Laguna, Rizal, and NCR. And just so you have an idea of where they're at, if you look at the map on the left side, the parts that are colored orange or sort of golden yellow, uh, that's like the province of Laguna. It's, it's in the southernmost tip of the lake and also even covers parts of the west, southwestern part, as well as the southeastern part, okay? The pink colored region, uh, pink or fuchsia or whatever you want to call it, but that shade anyway, that's the province of Rizal. And that's uh, in the north, mostly north, but you know, it's referred to as the northeastern part of uh, the lake. And on the north, western part 
of the lake. That's where you would find in green the national capital region. Okay, so that's kind of how it is laid out in terms of which borders where or where a particular province is in relation to the lake. Okay, so let's move forward. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, how uh, big it is. You know, how much volumes of water. Um, how many provinces it touches and how many municipalities and barangays it touches so we know how huge this lake really is which makes sense when they refer to it as the largest lake in the Philippines okay and being that it is the largest lake in the Philippines surely it would also provide now a number of resources where there's a source for a number of resources let's take a look at uh, this lake as a resource. What exactly will we find here as resources? Okay, uh, first and which is this is probably the most obvious and in fact it's the most dominant resource in the lake is uh, fisheries. Okay, when we're talking about the fisheries what we're gonna talk about here is the amount of fish products or fishery products that are taken out of this lake. Okay, and uh, we're, if we're just talking about the native fishes that are not bred or whatever, you know, they're not part of the aquaculture, right? They're not, they're just native. They're out in the wild in the lake itself. We're talking about a production of nearly 151,000 metric tons of fish products. Metric tons, that's a lot, okay? So just to allow us to wrap our heads around what that means a metric ton is one metric ton is equivalent to 1000 kilos 1000 kilos so we can easily gauge what one kilo is like in terms of weight and possibly volume but you know based on that we i'm sure you could sort of gauge what 1000 kilos would be okay now you multiply that a thousand times, that's metric tons. That's one metric tons. Okay. So in terms of the kind of the amount, the, num the, the, the amounts of fish that's produced out of this lake, okay, we're talking about a, a nearly 150,000 metric tons. So you see how voluminous that is. Okay. All right. What else? Under fisheries, I mentioned aquaculture earlier. So. The, uh, the fish that's produced out of uh, aquaculture facilities, okay, which is not included in the first set of numbers I gave you, uh, the aquaculture uh, outputs or production uh, is 63,490 metric tons. Again, metric tons, that's still significant. Not as significant as uh, the fish production from just out in the wild in the lake, but still significant considering that one metric ton is equivalent to 1,000 kilos okay <clears throat> what other um, what other numbers could we add to this <laughs> not that we can't you know we should not anymore because it's already pretty overwhelming but you know there are other numbers that add to this and that's basically uh, what uh, you know um, fish products that kind of uh, come out of municipal waters okay recall our discussion uh, in the last lesson about municipal waters so naturally this lake also has municipal waters so the numbers I gave you earlier uh, on the 151,000 metric tons as well as the 63,000 metric tons from aquaculture those numbers don't yet include municipal water so, you know, at least fish uh, fishery that's uh, taken that's produced out of municipal waters okay so if we were to add the municipal waters, we would be adding 87,467 metric tons. So in all, that's that's a lot. You know, it's a over very, it's really overwhelming. Um, and by the way, this number, these statistics, uh, were based on that produced in 2012. That was eight years ago. So surely by now that number has changed, and I'm thinking the change would be that it would have increased especially considering the purpose of this law which is to ensure the sustainability you know that there's a means to regenerate whatever is being taken out but surely there's also some programs that would aim to 
increase to keep up with the growing population. So again, this is an eight-year-old number that, uh, that, that I gave you and surely by now because uh, things have changed, um, there's a good chance that these numbers are even greater, okay? So what other resources might we find in the Laguna Lake? Okay. Agriculture, okay. Uh, yeah, naturally it's not the lake itself that would produce agriculture products. But what we're talking about here really is um, the use of the lake in agriculture, namely as a uh, source of water um, to a, uh, you know a certain number of er uh, areas that could be uh, targets uh, for irrigation. Okay, so irrigation, as we know, is the means of Tapping it in, tapping into a body of water, and you know, like maybe a pipe or something, and being able to take that, to suck that water, and bring it to a given area where there's plantation that need to be um, watered regularly. Okay, so here, um, the, again, this is also a 2012 number. It was said at the time, according to the uh, National Irrigation Administration. Sorry, this is actually a 2013 number, December 2013. According to the National Irrigation Administration, there are there were uh, at the time in 2013 32,684 sorry 32,684 potential estimated irrigable areas. So those are basically any of those uh, areas within the three provinces. Um, nonetheless, 32,000. It's a significant number of areas that could be the target for irrigation source from Laguna Lake. Okay. Besides uh, agriculture, what else, what other resources might be, what might we find uh, in Laguna Lake? Okay, well, of course, uh, agriculture, rather, uh, in agriculture, we already said irrigation and in a way that means it's a water supply, but the water supply that's being discussed here uh, refers to the water that ends up in our homes. You know, the, the same that is brought to our ho homes by Mainilad, okay? So Mainilad uh, not only gets its water sources from various uh, reservoirs near near the metro Manila area, um, so it's not only the, the places that we may be thinking of, but also uh, Laguna Lake is among its sources, okay? And uh, let's see, did I provide numbers? No, I didn't. Okay. So in terms of water supply, again, uh, it provides us a water supply. And, and the, the water that we're talking about is the same one that comes out of our faucet. Okay. So Laguna Lake provides us a source for that. Okay. Manila is what brings us that water from Laguna Lake, among other reservoirs. Okay. So in addition to water supply, another resource that you can say comes from, perhaps not directly, but comes from uh, the Laguna Lake is electricity, okay? And uh, the way this is uh, done is through three uh, power plants. There are three power plants that actually um, take water from Laguna Lake and from that water that they're able to take, they're able to generate electricity. Uh, whether it's through some kind of, uh, you know, free-flowing, like a dam, you know, where they dam it, and then the, the energy uh, of the, the current flowing water generates electric, extra electricity. You know, whether it's through that means or some other means, uh, the point is there are three power plants that generate, let's see, 758 megawatts of total dependable capacity okay and again that's uh, three power plants that are getting um, essentially that energy from Laguna Lake uh, one of one of those power plants provide the bulk uh, I said 758 it's uh, Kalayaan that power plant called Kalayaan produces about 720 megawatts and then the other two you know they uh, don't provide as much but they do still add to the number, okay? 
what other resources or uses might there be from the Laguna Lake? Well, let's take a look, okay? Flood water reservoir, okay. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, so far, I think many of what we've mentioned, um, or at least some of what we previously mentioned, talk about taking from the lake and using that as a resource for something. Uh, flood water reserv reservoir, uh, Lisa's concept, is the reverse of that. What uh, the, re the lake is being used for here is um, as a reservoir, as a place where water is to be put into, okay? And the kind of water that we're talking about is flood water, okay? And so this flood water reservoir concept is aimed to reduce flood water in parts of uh, the area, um, most notably that from Metro Manila. You might recall, or I'm sure you're familiar, living here in, uh, more than familiar, living here in Metro Manila, that uh, it doesn't take very much rain for Metro Manila to get flooded. It only takes a short uh, downpour, you know, a large downpour, downpour of rain, 10 minutes, 15, 20, or even just 20 minutes. And surely the entire Metro Manila uh, that is rained on would already be flooded easily. Uh, but we do know that the water does not stay very long. It eventually subsides. Depending on how much water there is, it can take minutes. And in worst cases, maybe hours, okay? But it does subside, right? And the question, of course, is where does that water go, okay? And uh, there's a flood water reservoir that answers where that water goes. The Laguna Lake is a flood water reservoir and that that water that comes from floods eventually make it to Laguna Lake okay and it, since it's serving as a reservoir and the question then is how does it get there yeah here in uh, in this region and in Metro Manila there's use there's actually two uh, companies that uh, provide the means for that water to get to Laguna Lake there's a company called Mangahan Floodway and another called Napindan Hydraulic Control System. And uh, they have the machinery that essentially um, sucks up all the water, all the flood water, okay, and brings it over and drains it or brings it to, delivers it to Laguna Lake. Uh, and so that's precisely uh, the purpose or the service that they provide. Okay, and uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of how flood water is reduced in Metro Manila and where it goes. All right. So, what other uses or resources uh, can we find uh, in Laguna Lake? All right. So, besides flood water reservoir, industrial cooling is another, and uh, this is essentially for companies or uh, organizations that manufacture or you know essentially they have large scale operations which require industrial grade cooling uh, and of course water is what they're using um, for that cooling system um, and again it's industrial grade so we're talking about uh, something that is a large scale um, that would take water from the lake and deliver it to that organization or that company and the company would do something to convert it into a cooling system, okay? Um, so that's one of the uses for the waters in Laguna Lake. And uh, let's see, what else might there be? Oh, actually, I think I have some numbers on this industrial cooling. Let's, let's see, just to kind of give you an idea of how much water is taken from the lake for this purpose. I think I do have the number, let's see. Yes, I do, okay. So every year, um, it is estimated that uh, 2.4 billion cubic meter of lake water is taken out of Laguna Lake to be used for this purpose, for, to be used as industrial cooling. So that's a lot of water, okay? But uh, nonetheless, uh, we are seeing, especially with the previous resource that we talked about, the flood water reservoir, that uh, there is a uh, a plan or a system in place 
that despite the amount of water that's being taken out of the lake, there is a system to put back water to replace what's been taken. So it's making it so that um, water is uh, renewable, it's, there's a sustainable system uh, so that uh, you know the, the lake doesn't dry out, so to speak. I mean, it probably won't anyway because the, as long as we're not in drought. But anyway, uh, that is part of the system in place, part of the uh, mechanisms that are provided by this law, uh, a plan that ensures that. So that's uh, this. This what we talked about. These two resources are great examples of what we might find in the law in terms of a plan to ensure that uh, you know there is uh, sustainability. Uh, okay. So let's move forward. Let's see what else do we have here. What other uses uh, or what uh, what other means is the Laguna Bay being used for as a resource? Let's see, I think I have a few more. Okay, business establishments. What we are referring to here is the number of establishments of enterprises, whether they're large, medium, or small. Uh, the number, the large number of them that uh, rely on the Laguna Lake to help them produce their products, okay? Whatever that product might be. Uh, as of uh, 2012, there were an estimated 500,000, so about a half a million of these enterprises, large, medium, and small, okay, that depend on the Laguna Lake. Um, there may be more and more of them now. Uh, again, this is an old statistic. It's the only one available, unfortunately, uh, at the time that uh, at the time that uh, this this uh, data was analyzed. Um, but anyway, it, it's very likely that the numbers are much greater now, okay. Um, so in any case, the, the use that they have is, you know, that they would tap the uh, Laguna Lake for, uh, you know, perhaps just the water, or maybe some other some of the other resources, to you know to aid them or to provide uh, as uh, raw materials uh, for their products. Okay. So what else? Okay. Um, as they say. It's cliche, really. They, they say that the shortest distance from one point to another is a straight line. Okay, so that's uh, what we're going to be talking about here when we talk about waterways. Okay, and let's say you're coming from Metro Manila, from the NCR, in the green area, if you're looking at the map. Okay, and uh, you have a need to get to the southeastern part of Laguna. Okay. Uh, what you would need to do if you had a car is to drive around along the western and southwestern part of the bay to get to your destination. So you'll be driving around almost like in a in a C configuration, okay? Uh, and uh, the distance would probably be greater compared to if you had to if you were just driving a straight line, okay? So since the Laguna Lake is a body of water that you know, people can use as a waterway, um, then essentially you are given the opportunity to um, take that straight line, that straight, uh, that, uh, that short distance, that straight line to give you that short distance. Yeah, granted, it may take a little longer, but uh, it is nonetheless an option that's you know, provided for by the lake. Okay, since it can serve as a waterway. Okay, and not only to transport persons, but uh, also uh, cargo. Uh, so that's another use for the Laguna Lake. What else? Recreation. Uh, okay, that's uh, pretty obvious. Uh, you know, picnic grounds, uh, and uh, you know it's also for people that enjoy fishing. You know, just recreational fishing. Not. Uh, you know, uh, not as a business or anything like that. Uh, boating and sailing, that sort of thing. So that's, you know, that's that's a uh, a use for uh, it's it's uh, you know, it's not for business or anything, probably uh, like that. But it is nonetheless a use that is worthwhile mentioning. A use of uh, the Laguna Lake. Okay. Uh, what else might there be? 
Okay, ecotourism, yes, um, that is uh, an important one, uh, especially now that we have a lot of uh, environmentally conscious uh, persons. Um, the uh, Laguna Lake is uh, an interesting body of water, you know, there is uh, some diversity there, uh, environmental diversity that uh, I'm sure would make it a worthwhile destination for tourists who are interested in ecotourism. So that's, uh, that's another one that we could add to, to the list, okay? Anyhow, uh, if you were to take everything that we've discussed, I mean, this, this is just a summary of um, what are the significant uses and what are the significant things that make uh, Laguna Lake an uh, important resource, okay? Um, and with this uh, just summary, we really are given a basis to say, you know, that this is really a significant resource. It's, it's a significant, um, you know, lake. It's it's something that uh, justifies the need for uh, protecting it, for ensuring that there is effective development, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, there, therefore, warranting or at least providing the justification and basis for the creation of this law. Okay. So with that said, I think at this point, uh, we have an idea of what this law really is all about and what it aims to do, what its purpose is. So I think at this point, we can now dive right in and see how it delivers on those objectives. Now, let's answer the question of uh, how uh, it provides, how does this law provide? Uh, how does it promote the and promote and accelerate the development and balanced growth of the Laguna Lake area. Okay. Uh, well, we, we know just based on the title of the law that it, you know, again, it creates a body, an authority. So essentially it is able to promote and accelerate uh, by creating the uh, Laguna Lake Development Authority. Okay. And the law naturally provides that in creating this authority, it, it provides for the powers, and functions, and duties of this authority. And uh, so, of course, these things that I just mentioned refer to special powers that it has, special powers and functions, and uh, also uh, corporate functions. Okay, and what do we mean by that? Okay, first of all, the LLDA is a quasi-government agency. And uh, by, a, by, by being called a, or referred to as a quasi-government agency, it has not only uh, regulatory functions, but also proprietary functions. And when we say proprietary functions, we are referring to uh, things that usually a uh, you know, regular corporation, a partnership, um, uh, what else? A natural person would be authorized to do under existing laws. Okay, so things like being able to enter into contracts of any kind, um, to acquire, buy, purchase, hold, or lease personal and real property as it deems necessary, um, to uh, purchase, hold, alienate, mortgage, pledge, or otherwise dispose of shares of the capital stock okay um, or bonds securities or other evidence of, of indebted, indebted indebtedness that is created by it as a corporation okay so it's, it can do those proprietary functions of course uh, as a quasi-government agency it's got regulatory uh, functions also uh, which uh, because it is a quasi-government agency uh, is uh, reporting to some other government agency and the that government agency that is given uh, that uh, supervision is the DNR the Department of Environment and Natural Resources take note though that the supervision is really just administrative so it doesn't have actual you know uh, supervision in terms of uh, uh, the policy creating you know, establishing policies and what our policy uh, making uh, supervision or anything like that. It's all just administrative, uh, just to facilitate uh, what the LLDA may need 
um, you know, source from the government, okay? So there you have it in terms of uh, uh, reporting structure. But what, what other uh, functions, regulatory functions, uh, what might we find under the law? Well, uh, one important one, <clears throat> um, which is really more of an obligation, is that the LLDA is to um, do or make uh, comprehensive surveys. And these surveys, of course, are purposed on determining the physical and natural resources as well as the potentials for the Lag Laguna Lake region. Okay, um, A quick point, uh, just to digress, when we say Laguna Lake region or occasionally maybe referred to as Laguna de Bay or Laguna de Bay region, we're really referring to the lake itself as well as the surrounding provinces. Essentially, if you remember the map that we were looking at just moments ago, uh, it's, it's all of those. The lake itself as well as the three provinces that are essentially uh, touching the lake. You have the Laguna province, uh, Rizal, and of course the National Capital Region. So again, that is the Laguna Lake Region. So when you hear me refer to Laguna Lake Region or Laguna de Bay Region, that's precisely who I'm referring to. So now we go back and resume with uh, enumerating some of uh, the LLDA's powers and function. So yes, of course, as a uh, government, quasi-government agency, <coughs> excuse me, it is uh, to regulate and monitor activities in the Laguna Lake region. Okay, so uh, not limited to just regulating. Of course, there is that proactive, you know, activity of monitoring exactly what is going on in the Laguna Lake region. Um, and uh, in order to be able to put some controls on those activities that it is mon it's mon regulating and monitoring, it naturally has to uh, have the ability to you know, permit and license those activities. So being that that's the case, it has exclusive jurisdiction to issue permits um, and, you know, for the use of all surface waters, for any projects or activities. So what kind of projects or activities is this uh, bullet point referring to? An example would be uh, sewage works and industrial waste disposal systems. Okay, before anybody undertakes any of that, there is a need to, of course, uh, obtain authority or be permitted by the LLDA. What else? Okay, um, the LLDA naturally, in order to preserve um, the Laguna Lake region so that it can be effective at promoting and accelerating its development and its balanced growth, okay, it uh, has the uh, powers and functions to ensure uh, prevention and abatement of pollution. Okay, so it does, uh, you know, uh, oversee licensing. I mean, there are certain cases where there may be a uh, a need to um, to discharge some additional waters into the lake, so you can't just basta magagawa You can't just discharge water in uh, Laguna Lake, especially mass amounts of water. Uh, there is ob obviously a need to uh, you know go to the LLDA and be authorized. In fact, they have they, they have those. Those permits that they specifically refer to refer to as dis discharge permits, okay, and and again that speaks uh, precisely to ensuring that uh, pollution is prevented and abated, okay. What else? Okay, so um, I think this is the last point on on this. Um, in order that the LLDA. Um, to again be effective, <clears throat> um, it is the law gives it uh, powers to create force multipliers, and what I mean by by that is it can actually tap other agencies. Okay, it can tap them uh, and seek from them assistance in enforcing, you know, its 
its authority uh, over the Laguna Lake region. Okay, it can deputize basically those uh, agencies, those appropriate government agencies or instrumentalities, again for the purpose of enforcing. Okay, so as you can see, the Laguna Lake Development Authority is imbued with broad powers, and again, this is important. Um, and, and by the way, that when we say broad powers, it's not limited to the, those that you know uh, regulatory uh, powers or functions, but uh, as we said earlier, proprietary functions. So again, that speaks to how broad its powers and functions are, and uh, of course, uh, that is so it can be effective in its uh, purpose of promoting and accelerating the development and balanced growth of the Laguna Lake region. Okay, so now let's proceed um, to talk about the next part in our discussion of the Laguna Lake Development Authority Act. And this one is the actually the last part. And we're going to proceed to talk about being the last part. Uh, of course, the focus would be on the acts that are punishable. We'll look to answer what is provided uh, by this law. Uh, as to what acts or omissions are punishable okay so in looking at the law itself you know um, we're gonna find a section only one section actually section 39a that provides for this so it's a little weird though pero let's let's see why that is and what else might be needed to make sure that we are able to effectively determine what acts are punishable okay um, all right so let's let's quickly read it section 39a it provides obviously for the penal penal but not just penal but even civil liability okay so it says any person natural or juridical juridical who shall violate any of the provisions of this act or any rule or regulation promulgated by the authority and the authority in this case is the LLDA pursuant thereto shall be liable for this punishment <clears throat> excuse me okay so um, looking at it we're able to answer at least one of the questions that we ask ourselves in trying to determine what the elements of the offense are okay and that first question of course is who is the offender who is liable for the act second question is what is that act that this person or this offender would be liable for okay and if that act by itself is not conclusively you know unlawful or by itself it's not unlawful what would make it unlawful that's the third question so let's see if we can answer those three questions from this clause uh, we can see that the first one uh, is answered the question of who the offender is it says any person but it's qualified by natural or juridical. So really the answer there to that first question is any natural or juridical person. So the question, if you don't know, or the next uh, logical question if you don't know is, what is the difference between a natural or juridical person, okay? Well, a natural person is just like you, you know, it's, just, it's you and I, where it's, you know, any human, any real person, okay, is a natural person. Okay, we have rights, you know, um, uh, that obviously need to, need to be protected, okay? So, you know, those are the qualities or the um, benefits, if you will, of being a natural person, right? A juridical person is a person, obviously not natural, but one that is created by law, okay? And the more obvious manifestation of that would be a corporation. Okay, they're created by law okay and they refer to them as persons because they're also entitled the rights that need to be protected okay so here um, the clause refers to any person and and it makes it clear that when it, it says any it's referring to both types of persons that have rights um, that must be protected so that's uh, natural persons, that's like you and I, real humans, and juridical persons, corporations and the like, alright, any entity.
validity that's created by law. Okay? So, yeah. Any natural or juridical person, that's essentially uh, our answer to, our, to the first question. Um, and then the uh, second question is, what is the act? And this is where it gets a little complicated. <coughs> because if you, uh, let's go ahead and uh, uh, just go ahead and annotate para mas madali. Um, so as I said, this is, you know, in answering the second question of what the act or mission is, medyo nagiging complicated kasi this clause or this provision says uh, who shall violate any of the provisions of this act or any rule or regulation promulgated by the authority or by the LLDA. Okay, um, so what this is really telling us is uh, the law says, hindi ko sasabihin sa'yo kung ano yung uh, offense. Okay, kailangan mong i-research pa. Okay, yeah. you have to look at a different, uh, a different source or other sources besides uh, this or, or as an alternative to this provision. Because this provision only, not only tells us who uh, the offender might be, um, but it gives instructions that you're not gonna find it here in this provision. You have to look elsewhere. And the elsewhere here really is uh, other provisions of this law, of the Laguna Lake Development Authority Act, as well as other rules or regulations that may be promulgated um, by the LLDA in pursuance to um, this clause, Section 39A. Okay? So, if we were to look at the provisions of the LLDA Act, this law that we're talking about, Dahil it really focuses in on you know creating the LLDA. So it talks about what kind of an entity it is. You know, again, it says it's a quasi-government agency. Okay. Um, it also talks about uh, its powers, duties, um, and functions. Okay. So yun ang tutok nga. Uh, and uh, at the moment, we're not gonna find if there's even any actually we're not gonna find any uh, specific provision that talks of a rule or regulation that people must abide by when they're in the Laguna Lake region okay uh, and being that that's the case uh, we'll have to look elsewhere okay uh, although okay not in an agencia because this you know the provision that says you know uh, you know look here at this law Kasi who knows, maybe at some point in time, in the future, baka, you know, the law may get amended and it may get added. So keep that in mind. So when you're a uh, environmental law enforcer and you're, let's say, you're given a jurisdiction involving the uh, Laguna Lake region, then, uh, you know, when you're trying to determine if a particular violation uh, was committed, uh, you'll also need to look into the... Laguna Lake Development Authority Act to see if there's anything there, anything new <laughs> um, that would constitute an offense. Uh, being there is none at the moment, uh, if really, if there's really none, okay, and from what I've seen, there is none, okay, uh, then it would make sense to look at the other sources. The other sources here, as the law provides, is uh, rules or regulations promulgated by the LLDA, okay. Now, the LLDA, as we said, is um, a quasi-government agency. And as a quasi-government agency, it has uh, proprietary functions. In essence, it is a corporation. And as a corporation, it follows the standards of how a corporation does business. Um, so when it makes certain announcements and promulgations of rules or anything like that it's usually done through board resolutions so no different here what we're gonna find where you know where we would find these uh, offenses would be in board resolutions okay but anyway before we proceed on to the board resolutions let's see if we could just uh, quickly put this on our worksheet we can sort of uh, as we've seen we could only identify who the uh, liable offender who the offender might be, who, who would be liable, okay? So it's any natural or juridical person as to the acts of remission, act or remission, we don't know yet, we'll have to look at the board resolutions, 
okay uh, all right so let's uh, proceed on uh, board resolutions uh, I but just keep in mind it's not just board re resolutions um, the IRR may also provide but uh, good uh, actually most probably most uh, are found on board resolutions. so let's take a look at board resolutions <coughs> okay you know like in any uh, organization or entity these days uh, the first place that uh, we would start in our search for answers would probably be the website and that's what we're going to do here we're going to look at the LLDA website and in that website uh, we do see that they are publishing uh, their board resolutions online and we can find them under the e-library tag under which is the laws and policies uh, menu option which if we choose it where we'll find two options the implemented laws which interestingly enough you could reference that because it contains all of the pertinent laws including the LLDA app okay so it's there and it's also a good place to go if you want to know if there's been any changes to these laws any amendments because they would surely post it there okay so implemented laws but our focus is board resolutions so we're gonna pick that options board resolutions and in picking that we're going to find essentially all board resolutions that the LLDA board uh, would publish. And of course, it's not limited to the offenses or, you know, to a resolution that talks about offenses. That means we'll have to sift through, you know, the board resolutions that it publishes to identify which board, specific board resolutions talk about offenses, okay? And uh, for this uh, presentation, I did find one that I'm going to use, and I'm going to pull it up here for you. <coughs> okay, uh, here it is. Um, it's one of the board resolutions. And in this one, there are a number of uh, violations that are listed. So if we're to look at uh, a couple of them, let's look at the first one. Uh, we'll see already that it gives us the answer to our question that's, as to what acts would constitute an offense okay um, so here let's read it operating emission sources installation without a permit to operate ESI or discharging wastewater without a discharge permit so there's technically there's two acts in the alternative so the first act is operating emission sources and the second is discharging wastewater so we know let's go ahead and pull that up on our worksheet uh, we know uh, exactly who the offender is because uh, as a default uh, L the LLDA Act tells us that it's any natural or juridical person so that's what we're gonna uh, identify as our answer to our first question and that's because also it's not otherwise stated in uh, this board resolution so keep that in mind you know there may be instances where the board resolution would either qualify or add or change uh, as to who might be liable okay but this one makes no mention of anyone else so we're gonna default to what was said by the LLDA Act okay and that's any natural or juridical person so back to the acts like I said there's two that are identified here but we'll focus on the first <clears throat> the first act is operating emission sources installation okay and uh, we also know that by that by, by itself okay it's not necessarily unlawful unless uh, it is done without a permit to operate okay so that is the qualifier so there you see uh, that the act is operating emission source installation and it becomes unlawful and a violation of this provision when it is done without a permit to operate ESI the second uh, act that we're seeing here is the act of discharging wastewater. It, the act of discharging wastewater is not necessarily unlawful, but it is when it is done without a discharge permit. By the way, this is an example of uh, the uh, pollution abatement that we talked about a moment ago, some, uh, some minutes ago. Um, you know, there's uh, clearly a need for a permit before anyone could discharge wastewater into the uh, Laguna Lake. So wastewater, of course, is, for example, yung pinaghugasan natin ng pinggan, pinaghugasan natin ng, uh, ng kotse, 
and that sort of thing. Okay, uh, but you know, I think it's also important to note that we we have to look at a different because uh, it's pro it's not here. We're, we'll have to look at the maybe in one of the resolutions uh, as to the legal definition of wastewater. Okay, we may need to do that because uh, there may be certain because I, I cited some basic examples of what I personally consider wastewater, you know, but it may not necessarily be considered uh, wastewater in the definition of law that would constitute a violation of this offense. So we have to remember in our as investigators or even prosecutors, we, we have to make sure that uh, whatever facts we're presented with uh, that says it's wastewater that was discharged, that uh, wastewater that's defined in that in those facts are the same wastewater that are within the definition of wastewater as defined in this law. So we have to remember to do that. Okay, that's just another tip. All right, so anyway, for this particular violation, again, we're seeing two acts uh, with qualifiers. All right, and I think I have a second one here which also presents a similar, uh, a similar circumstance to what I just, just moments ago talked about. And this one, the act here is constructing, operating fish pen in excess of the allowable allocated area. So before we discuss this provision or this offense, let's just quickly pull it up on our worksheet first. All right, so offender is as indicated at on, uh, as uh, uh, made default in Section 39A of the LLDA Act, and that's any person, any natural or juridical person. The act or omission is that of constructing or operating a fish pen and the qualifier is that uh, it is in excess of the allowable or in excess of the allocated area. Okay, so that's the qualifier. Alright, so now let's discuss this. If you were to read this, um, you know, surely you'll be able to quickly see that uh, there, there's a kind of a gray area, okay, specifically on the qualifier. <clears throat> um, what is uh, you know what is considered in excess of what is allowed okay or what is allocated um, what is uh, in my opinion uh, is not excessive may be excessive to you right and may be different with another person so here there is a need to clarify what is allowable and what is allocated area okay so this provision by itself is not conclusive you know it doesn't say quite just yet you know uh, how this becomes unlawful okay it just says that you know it's in it's in excess of an uh, of the allowable or in excess of the allocated area okay we still need to determine what is allowable and what is allocated and surely you know that is something that would be found somewhere in any of the uh, provisions of law, whether it's on the LLDA Act, perhaps in the um, definition of terms, um, or in many, may, maybe in some of the other provisions in that law, or it could be in another board resolution. Okay, but uh, again, as it is, this here, this uh, provision by itself is not conclusive to tell you uh, when this is an unlawful act, when constructing and operating a fish pen is considered an unlawful act okay so you still have to do that extra research all right so anyway that's uh, that's pretty much it um, the rest I think I will just leave to you as I have done with the other provisions from other lessons I will leave to you I will encourage you I'd like to encourage you to do your own uh, research your own exercises uh, search the uh, LLDA website for other resolutions that may provide offenses Look at how it's defined, break it out, you know, identify the elements, and, and see if there are any, any other issues like the one that we are just discussing now uh, that may need additional references. Um, and, and see if you can find those answers. Uh, I think there would be, this would be a good exercise to help you on your journey, uh, to hone your skills and you know, allow you to be you know, able to quickly ascertain when a violation is uh, present before you, okay? Whether it's you know through evidence that's provided to you, or just you know, maybe you've uh, witnessed it yourself, okay. So 
that being said um, we are actually done now at this point uh, we're uh, essentially with uh, lesson two and since lesson two is the last lesson in blue laws it also means that we are done with blue laws so with that said I'm gonna say goodbye for now and I will uh, look forward to another talk with you on the next module uh, which is on brown laws until then <laughs>